Welcome to the Jonathan underscore Foster podcast, a series of audio recording files where Jonathan engages with questions and concepts through the lens of Rene Sherard's mimetic theory and open and relational theology. There are a lot of great podcasts out there, but when you think about it, really, this is probably the best one. It's season five, and our theme is Frequently Asked Questions. If you like the show, leave a review, and most importantly, sign up for Jonathan's newsletter at jonathanfosteronline.com. All right. Thanks for being back with me. I mean, you didn't have to do that, but here you are. Glad uh, to be hanging out. As we talk a bit about meaning making today, I got a lot of questions recently from young people. And when I say young people, I'm talking mostly college age, but the truth is this kind of stuff kind of haunts all of us. It follows all of us around. It's not like uh, for most people as they get old, they get it figured out. And I know I'm still working through a lot of it. A lot of the work that I've done in my dissertation and through the book now that's coming out later this fall, uh, called Theology of Consent, Mimetic Theory in an Open and Relational Universe, has a lot to do with meaning making. It, I didn't write it expressly for that purpose, but it turns out that there's a lot of overlap. And so when I, when I began to think about these questions, I thought, oh yeah, my thoughts um, with Girard and my thoughts as they work through open and relational theology have a lot to say about this. And also my thoughts as I interact with uh, psychoanalytic theory, which I try to do a little bit as much as I possibly can. It's a, well, all of these concepts are are pretty challenging, are they not? So today we're going to talk about meaning making. I'm going to jump right into it because it's, uh, I got a lot to cover, but I do want to remind you that at the end of this episode, I'm going to be hanging out with my friend Lauren, who's a licensed therapist, and she and I are going to be diving into this topic a little bit more on my Patreon page. And I think maybe when I was introducing this whole idea of having some friends on, I might have said Lauren was in her 20s, and she's probably fine with that. There's a good chance she's no longer in her 20s. It just feels like, you know, it feels like she should be. But she might be in her 30s now. Either way, she's cool, and uh, you're going to like that if you tune into it. Okay, meaning making. Um, Here's what we need to unpack and to keep in mind. Human beings are meaning-making creatures who use language, and they're language makers who use meaning. So an appeal to meaning is an appeal to language. So when it comes to language and meaning, uh, psychoanalytics borrows from a guy by the name of De Saucer, French guy, obviously. And so the thing to keep in mind here is that language structures the way we process life, the way we get to what we think what some call our subjectivity. Subjectivity is essentially, yeah, the way we think, who we are, who we see ourselves in the world, how do we process life. So in other words, um, the question of meaning is completely bound up with linguistics because words, they find their meaning in relation to other words. This is a phenomenon known as metonymy. It's a fun word to say, so say it with me. One, two, three. Metonymy. Metonymy. Nice. Metonymy. Okay, it's, it's easy for me to get sidetracked. So we're back. We're talking about words. We're talking about metonymy. Um, think about the dictionary for a second. A dictionary is made up of words. So consider what it's like to look up uh, the definition of a word. You look up a word. And you realize that it's being defined by other words. So you, you go to look up those other words and you realize they're being defined by yet even more words. On and on it goes. It never really stops. It's circular in this way. It's, it's moving. It's fluid. It's like a sea. There's no real way to grab onto anything. 
There are areas, of course, where things, you know, the viscosity thickens a bit, stuff slows down. Uh, Jacques Lacan, who's a really important uh, psychoanalytic thinker, he'll call this the quilting point where words kind of come together and we, we kind of all agree that they signify certain things, which is really helpful because then we don't have to use, you know, an overabundance of words. But um, all in all, it never really stops for, for very long because nothing lasts. It's this entropic environment where words kind of come and go and contexts come and go and meetings come and go. Now, it's important to say that this isn't a devious observation. This isn't pointed out in order to stir up anarchy. And I think some people, well, I know some people think it's the reason we bring some of these things up. It's not to stir up anarchy. Uh, I don't talk this way to freak you out. Rather, honestly, what I think is going on is probably all of us are already freaked out. Because intuitively, we know that the sea is changing, that you really can't grab onto it, that stuff isn't completely stable. I mean, especially right now, right? I mean, there's so much going on in our media and our business corporations and government, good grief, the church. We've collectively lost um, a real sense of trust in these big um, conglomerations. These big institutions is probably a better word. So honestly, I'm just trying to define reality, man. Um, wasn't that long ago, and I hear this kind of stuff all the time, but just recently, a really famous megachurch pastor, he did a series of sermons on how dangerous deconstruction is, how it's really just a tool of evil. Good grief. It's basically just a ramped up, modernized way to shame a lot of young people for having doubts. And I'm like, seriously, man? If there, if there weren't any doubts, there'd be no reason for faith. So I'm telling you, it's not a sign that you're evil or sinning or bad or even anti-establishment by admitting this. You know what it's a sign of? It's called intellectual honesty. Yeah. Nevertheless, it's challenging because as you're realizing now to make meaning in a sea of moving words and definitions and contexts, it's tough. And this is always so, but I think even more so right now because of the intense convulsion, you know, that we're going through, like we just mentioned with our institutions. Uh, I was thinking about this again a little bit more. I was perusing the internet and I came across some Pew Research, P-E-W, and they usually do some good work. I was perusing the pew, as it were, and I was reminded by the research that uh, the way they were presenting it, that conservatives, they're more likely than liberals, let's say, to point to faith as a reason that they have meaning in life, as a way to make meaning, which is fair enough and I think probably true. But a problem is a lot of folks that I've interacted with who have come out of conservative settings are going through a real life active disturbance in their very construct of what faith is. When you're brought up experiencing particular patterns, watching your family make sense of life in a, in a specific way, going through certain rituals, hearing consistent uh, religious language, well, your brain, of course, will form around those patterns and those desires. And so when you begin to reconsider those desires, well, it's gonna mess with your internal meaning-making program. You're trying to make sense, but the way you've always made sense has been disassembled. You understand what I'm saying? You, you can't even make sense sometimes in that, in that regard. I don't think I can stress this enough. It's like trying to rebuild a foundation, but the concrete mix you're using, it isn't setting up like it used to. It's like trying to reframe the walls, but the two by fours are made of plastic or something. It's a real unsettling, destabilizing feeling. And so I think it's important to remind yourself all along the way that you need to give yourself space and grace to just feel these things, to acknowledge these things, to recognize that, yeah, to enter into these questions is to enter in a type of destabilization. And so when the megachurch pastor shames you for feeling this way, man, just take a breath, forgive him as best you can, 
and just say, no, this is a real thing in my life and I want to acknowledge it. I don't need to suppress it. I don't need to pretend that it's not a reality. The reality is my meaning making system has been disturbed and I need to enter into that in order to reconstruct. Because otherwise you're just going to replicate some of the same old stuff. And frankly, a lot of us, and we just have no interest in replicating the same old stuff. Part of what I do in Theology of Consent um, is to start with relationality, which makes a lot of sense because the very key concept with open and relational theology is relationality. And actually with Girardian thinking, it's very key to, he might use a different word like uh, interdividuality, which is a great word, but it's still relationality. Remembering that we are who we are in relationship with others. In fact, everything is what it is in relationship with others. So it's not a substance-based reality. It's an organic relationship-based reality. It's not static in being. It's process and becoming. Again, this is, the, this is the heart of open and relational thinking. So as I said, Girard might or Girardians might use a word like interdividuality. But it's the same idea in terms of relationship. And what it means is um, it, when you say individuality, it's to say that our desires are being affected by the desires all around us. So in other words, you will not find meaning without the influence of others. It's impossible to do so. It's not like you can grow up and then decide, oh, now I find this meaningful. Oh, now this is what I want. No, your, your very growing up experience is threaded through and through with the desires of, other, of others. And so you're being formed by others all the way along. You're experiencing their meaning-making stories, their ideas, rituals, and patterns. And it's fine, except when it's not fine. Because it'll influence you in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways you may recognize, and other ways you may never really um, get to the bottom of. And you'll begin to imitate what other people do, what they wear, what they eat, who they're with when they wear that thing, and what they act like when they eat that thing. You'll put an inordinate amount of attention upon whatever that thing is. And strangely, what it does is it only encourages your model to put more attention on that thing as well, because they're individuals too. They live in a relational cosmos, cosmos as well. And so then in the midst of all that attention, antagonism can easily begin to build. And then in time, you realize you're both going for the same kinds of things. And then your relationship has turned rivalrous on your way towards those things, which colors your meaning-making journey. <laughs> so uh, meaning-making is challenging, first of all, because words and definitions change. Second of all, it's challenging because... Whether we like it or not, others influence us. And then there's a third challenge here. It appears that what seems to be true is that all of us are trying to figure out meaning and who we are and our own subjectivity against what I call a billowing backdrop of insecurity. It's anxiety, it's awareness of our own, to use a psychoanalytic word, lack. We're intensely aware of our own lack. And that does seem to be a common denominator between all of us humans. And it exacerbates everything. It intensifies our awareness of the other. And it tempts us to imagine that the other doesn't experience lack, which is why we imitate them. Because, gosh, look at them. They got it together. I mean, look at where they live and what they drive, what they talk like, uh, who they're with, what they do, their Instagram posts. Yeah, mostly I'm just talking about Instagram posts, right? Social media, the uh, algorithmic tribalistic media that exists and is so prevalent in our world. So because we're so aware of them and so aware of our own problems, we are then driven to imitate them. This is, this is a Girardian kind of thinking. We're trying to manage our own lack. We're trying to fill the holes inside of us 
by doing what they do, by adopting their practices, by imitating their supposed non-lacking life. We think they have a secret and we want it. We want to be like them. My go-to example here is the movie Prestige. I don't know if you've seen it. It's been out for a while. There are two main guys. Uh, Angier, I think is how you pronounce his last name, and Borden. And they're magicians. And really, it's just a show about two guys in rivalry. They're in a rivalrous relationship, imitating each other, each trying to outdo the other with some ridiculous trick. At one point in the show, when Angier's wife has died due to the rivalry, someone is attempting to console Angier and dissuade him of his obsession with Borden. And he's told his actions, they won't bring his wife back. But in his response, you see the truth. You realize that his pain, it's not primarily about the loss of his wife. His pain emanates from the perception that his rival holds the secret to his lack of wholeness. This is his diary, Olivia. All of his secrets are right here in my hands. It won't bring your wife back. I don't care about my wife. I care about his secret. It's a brutal line, a brutal scene, uh, the way it plays out. It's obviously much better watching than listening uh, to, a, to a bad audio clip of it. But yeah, he says, I don't care about my wife. I care about his secret. Actually, if you watch Christopher Nolan shows, you'll see a lot of mimetic relational stuff playing out. So yeah, a lot of us recognize that at some level, this is what's going on with us. We're trying to make sense of things, but we're aware of our own lack. And then we're aware of the other who seemingly has no lack. And it just wears us out. I think humanity is just fatigued under the burden of all this. And we keep going after stuff and things to fill that proverbial hole inside of us. Now, a side note here, uh, this is why I am so suspicious of capitalism in general. It's a system that preys upon our lack. It keeps us suspended in a constant state of desiring the next thing, of buying the next thing, imagining that the next thing holds the secret, that that's where we'll find fulfillment. Well, at this point, a lot of us turn to religion, which makes sense because we're trying to go deeper. We realize that the things we've been, you know, filling ourselves up with aren't working. So if you think about Americanized Christianity, it'll come along um, and its response fits very nicely within this whole thing because it'll say, yeah, you've been trying to fill this hole that can only be filled by Christ. You've probably heard that. It's an old uh, Pascal saying, God-shaped hole. It can only be filled by God. So then we go that route because that, that sounds plausible. It sounds like it makes sense. The problem is that doesn't really work either. Which, by the way, is part of the reason why I think you're listening right now. Because if it worked, you wouldn't be searching so much. And if it worked, you would know that, that people who had accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they'd be fulfilled and they'd be happy, which would result in them actually acting better than we see a lot of people who call themselves Christians acting. And I'm not suggesting that everyone acts bad or is bad. And I'm not suggesting that there isn't some value here. But it's been totally, in my opinion, mispackaged, overbilled, like we've been misled. The bottom line is one isn't happy or fulfilled just because they're a Christian. Now, it can provide a sense of belonging. Well, I guess until you don't adhere to their values and then you won't belong anymore. But in theory, it can provide a sense of belonging. It can provide a sense of something going on that's like bigger than them, bigger than us. And, and those are good things. But I genuinely don't believe it's meant as a cure-all in the sense that it's supposed to fill our, what, our deep desire for metaphysical autonomy. Now, there are probably a lot of reasons why it doesn't work, but, but here's one. And um, if you haven't listened to the end of the introduction to season five episode, I will reference that here because that's really key here where I begin to talk about relationality. And of course, even as I began to get into it in this episode, one of the reasons it doesn't work is it because it presupposes God to be separate from us. Which again, as I've already talked about, that defies the fundamental nature of reality, which is that we live in a relational world. Nothing is separate. So I don't think God was or is separate. 
To believe that, you'd have to deny reality. And also, for those of us who care about such things, you'd have to deny the biblical witness of a God with us, of a God being the one in whom we live and move and have our being, of God being closer than a brother, of God being close to the brokenhearted, of God being the fullness of everything that is. To use the God-shaped whole approach in the way that American Christianity does, it, it just doesn't work because God's not a separate thing. It's not distant from us, like some puzzle piece that we slot into our heart somewhere. No. The divine is with us, all around us. Furthermore, I don't have just one hole. I have a lot of holes, cracks, broken things, crevices in my life. They flow in and out of the nexus of who I am, the intersection of spirit and will and physicality and sexuality and trauma and mentality, etc., It's not like there's one non-temporal spiritual place that God can reside. No, I think she resides in everything. She flows in and out of all of it, even as I flow in and out of her. Evangelical world has no language for this. I mean, I can't stress this enough. No imagination for this. It's probably the real reason why I got voted off the conservative denominational island. They need God to be separate. They need those insecurities and anxieties that we feel, that lack, to be evidence that we are separate because then they can cue Jesus to ride in on the white horse and have him fill us, fix us, make us complete, save us, take our sense of lack away. Finally, right? Just one more altar call, one more verse and uh, get the kid to come down to the altar to get him filled with God. I think it's profoundly misleading. So I started thinking, well, along with a lot of other people who've been thinking this, what would it mean? What does it mean if God has been with us all along in all those holes, in the folds of the billowing backdrops of insecurity? I don't need to get him in there. He's already there. Well, for me, it it just slowly and then quickly picked up speed. It began to change my whole approach. So I I no longer struggle to help people find the lost object so that they can be fulfilled. I don't think it's about the struggle to find meaning. Really, I think it's about finding meaning in the struggle. I can probably say is you're never going to free yourself from certain anxieties. It's just a part of what it means to be human. But that doesn't mean God's not with you or doesn't care about you or doesn't believe in you or that God is not with you as a partner helping you find meaning in the struggle. Your subjectivity, which is again, the the way you look at life, the way you feel about yourself, it's never going to feel completely whole. And that's okay. You don't need to be whole because love is with you. So it's not going to fix you or take away your lack. But by faith, what I imagine it can do, it's, it can help you come up with ways to work through your issues, to be patient, to never leave you, to always be bringing that procreative energy, that resourceful energy into each and every situation, and to do it in a way that's not shaming you or keeping record of wrongs. So I just would encourage you, don't try to get your life cleaned up in order to find meaning. I mean, if you want to clean your life up, that's fine, you know, to be more productive, to be an active participant in society, uh, to find a lifelong partner, to be a better parent, but it's not necessarily going to help you find meaning. Meaning making is a lifelong journey, and honestly, you never really arrive. brings up other subjects too, like the idea of being 
because if one never quite arrives, it means that the topic of being itself can be a bit misleading too, as if there's some nirvana state, uh, some spot of ultimate rest that exists in the world, a being uh, that is billed as this static geographical spot or emotional spot that we can arrive at. Um, I don't think that that's exactly right. I think there's more value in becoming over being, in movement over static, in relationship over separated substance, and living and responding in time. So I'm hoping to find rest. I'm hoping to thread my meaning through and through with restful moments, but not static rest, more like a rhythmic kind of a rest. So don't just be, become. I write about this in Theology of Consent, so I invite you just to take a breath and think about this for a moment. Open and relational theology holds deep respect for philosophies of being, yet within these states of pure being, for example, timelessness, how can we begin to speak of existing? It seems essential to respectfully pose questions. Might being be illusory? Might it lead us to misunderstand the possibilities that timelessness affords, for how does an event occur outside of time? Open and relational theology can agree that none of us are isolated from the larger relational whole, a type of oceanic oneness, that extends infinitely in time, but pure states of being don't seem to offer the potential of an I, or us, or for that matter, something approximating oceanic. Of course, given that the ocean changes and becomes... Well, that dovetails into another topic, the topic of time, the reality of it. How I think it's the thing that we're all really pushing up against. The reason we do feel this anxiety in the first place, it's because time never stops. And we feel that, we know that, we're intensely aware of it. We don't always talk about it, Um, but it's very much, it's very much, I think, in our collective, maybe subconscious Um, To borrow a Jungian phrase, um, I think that's probably true. Limits and finitudes are overwhelming. But anyhow, that's probably for another question. So a bunch of questions have been posed that I kind of wrapped up into this question of, who am I supposed to be? Well, I would answer that by saying it's not really one thing. And so really a better question might be, who am I becoming? Again and again, every single moment. Because I'm telling you, man, about the, about the time you get used to one thing in life, the next thing will be there. And then you'll just be invited to change into that next thing. And the process never stops. It's called life. You're constantly in relationship with others and with all of creation. So meaning making is not a destination. It's what you're doing along the way. Meaning is not static. It's what happens when something ruptures the static reality that we've all tried to fabricate. Now, I do by faith believe that there's something in that rupture, like, or someone maybe. I think it might be God, and I think God might be love. I think love is the rupture, and it's calling us forward, asking us to give ourselves to others, but not in a self-denial, like self-scapegoating, self-flagellating kind of doormat way, but rather in an esteeming way. Because love isn't in rivalry with us and God isn't in in rivalry with us. So be really careful when you're, when you hear the preacher talk about how God needs you to die out to your will and that God wants to use you and that God's in control. Like my, uh, what, the hairs on the back of my neck kind of go up when I hear that kind of language. I'm not sure that that's healthy. I get the sentiment but I don't think God uses us. I don't think God controls us. And I don't think God needs us to die to our will. I think rather that God is a consensual God and wants to partner with us. And so he or she and us, we get to decide together how to make meaning. Because the fundamental characteristic of God, I think the truest thing you can say is that God is love. And if God is love, then God must be a consensual God, because love doesn't control. Well, this sets us off on a whole nother journey, like this meaning-making journey that's not about morality. It's not about behavior, all those thing, although those things play a role. Rather, um, I think it's more helpful 
more meaningful, so to speak, to say it's, it's a journey of beauty. Alfred North Whitehead helps me say this. He, he gives me the faith to say this as well. He, he says the fundamental aim of the universe is not morality, it's beauty. And beauty for him is essentially the harmonization of diversity, the resonance that we can find in all these different strands of things that are going on in life. Again, a complexity of factors are involved in you making meaning. But if you, if you pursue beauty, you're going to make meaning in your life. You're going to find it to be meaningful. If you pursue morality, it'll work for a season, but it will leave you hungry. It'll leave you hurting. It'll leave you, I promise you, it'll leave you behind. If you pursue meaning by trying to find, you know, the right kind of behavior modification principles, it'll serve you okay for a few days. But after a while, it won't care about you any longer because that beast, all it cares about is your behavior. Beauty is a whole different thing. An evangelical world, an Americanized Christianity they don't have any language or imagination for it. And so I have compassion for them, but I have compassion for you too. So take a breath and realize that in the middle of all these challenges that God wants to partner with you. And so he's waiting for you to decide. And then you and God get to partner together to struggle through life, to find meaning along the way. And as you find meaning along the way, to make meaning of the struggle. Victor Frankl says the meaning of life is to give life meaning. Okay, well, I hope you found something meaningful there as we talked about meaning. It'd be good for me to be meaningful. And if you jump on over to the Patreon page, you'll get to be a part of a conversation that I had with my longtime friend. When I say long time, I'm talking about 32 years I've known this young lady. Uh, who's a counselor and a therapist, and uh, her name is Lauren Kilber. And so I asked her to join me there to talk more about meaning making. And she has some really good stuff to say. In fact, here's just a few seconds of it. Stuff I related to church. So I don't think this is everybody's experience, um, whatever. But for me, yeah, like Christianity and church just feels like it. The way I inter like internalized it was it's very a, a very was a very disempowering thing. Um, but but like I didn't feel I didn't know it. <laughs> um, but it's like it, it almost perpetuates that um that that belief that like I am not enough. I am not enough on my own, I'm not good enough on my own that I need something, you know, external from me to come and fill this D this hole. Uh, a lot of times it's how it like was described, right? Like God shaped hole. Yeah. Yes. Um, this it's something that's bad or defective about me or just not good enough um, that I need something external from me to come in and like transform that, heal it, feel, fill it. Uh, then I'll be good. Um, and I think as a little girl, how I internalized all of this too, is just that like, I need God to, to do things. See, I told you it was good. You're going to want to hear all of that. So I hope to see you there on Patreon. All right, everyone. Have a great week. Clint, take it away for us. Thanks for being a part of the podcast. Jump onto Patreon to get access to Dr. Jay's writing, in-depth interviews with some of his therapist friends, and most importantly, his unbelievably funny cartoon sketches. All of that kind of stuff can be found at patreon.com forward slash Jonathan underscore Foster. Check it out. No, really, go do it now.